Okay, so we are starting off today with a question and answer session on all this material on partially ordered sets and so on. Yeah, let me grab my copy. Does anyone have, have I hope that everybody's looked through this section on partially ordered sets. It seems to me that the most important thing you need to know is how is about Zorn's lemma and how to apply it. So there's a lot of stuff in here about all the, these different conditions and how they're equivalent to each other. But I think that uh, the most important thing is to know Zorn's lemma and how to apply it. Because that will come in in lots of different proofs in this module. But uh, on the other hand, you may have questions about any, any of the other stuff in there, in the partially ordered set section. So does anybody have any prepared questions you want to ask me about from the material, from the questions in that section, or from the solutions? Yes? Does the axiom of choice give us any sort of uniqueness? Or can we have F8 take the same value for two different subsets? So, uh, so the axiom of choice, you don't usually have any sort of uniqueness. On the other hand, if you, if you, have, if you use a well-ordering principle, and if, if you've, once you've selected, say, a well-order, then you get uniqueness because you, you've got a well-order to work with. When you're working at the level of the axiom of choice, you don't expect uniqueness because if, essentially you'll get uniqueness if and only if there's exactly one element in each set. <laughs> um, so you then have to choose that element. Otherwise you're bound to have an element of choice. Which is really what it's all about. So, so you don't expect to get uniqueness from the, uh, it, it, of the choice function. Are there any other, have you got any other questions? Yeah? Uh, no, I can't do that. I can use Zorn's lemma, I can, I can do Zorn's lemma implies the axiom of choice, um, which is I think on one of the question sheets anyway. Um, the axiom of choice implies Zorn's lemma, I think is much harder. So, for the axiom of choice implies Zorn's lemma, I'll refer you to one of the appendices in Rudin's Real and Complex Analysis. I can never remember that one off by heart, and it's, it's quite long and interesting. <laughs> um, so what in, in Rudin Rudin Complex Analysis, he uses the axiom of choice to prove the Hausdorff maximality theorem. Hausdorff maximality theorem is easily equivalent to Zorn's lemma. That's, that's relatively easy, um, as long as you get around the notational and terminology issues. So, um, so... So Zorn's lemma implies axiom of choice is relatively easy. See question sheet. Basically, you try to define your choice function on as many sets as possible, and then you can always define it on one more set. Um, and then the Zorn's lemma take, gets you home, and your choice, and then you've got your choice function defined on everything. Um, the Zorn's lemma, if and only if Hausdorff maximality theorem. is also relatively easy. Uh, for Zorn's lemma implies Hausdorff maximality theorem is uh, 
Hausdorff mathematical theorem, you're supposed to try and get a maximal chain, as big a chain as possible. Um, if you haven't got as big a chain as possible, then that's because you can always add one, that's because you can add another element to it. So if you look at, all, if you look at your collection of all chains, um, Zorn's lemma quite easily gives you a maximal chain. Um, it's, a funny, it's a funny little bit of logic, actually, but, uh, but it's, it's relatively easy. But uh, to get from the actual choice to the others is unfortunately harder. Um, so, for the actual choice to imply a Hausdorff maximality theorem or Zorn's lemma, which of course is equivalent, um, see Rudin real and complex analysis. There's an appendix in there. Um, Of course, you'll find it all over the place as well, but uh, that's the proof. That's the proof that I worked through once to convince myself that it was really true, um, but I find that one harder. But we will be assuming the actor of choice, and in view of that, we will be assuming Zorn's lemma, and Zorn's lemma is the one we're going to use in this module at various points. Not everybody accepts this. Um, it is independent, again, of the other axioms of set theory. So uh, you, you don't necessarily have to accept the axiom of choice. If you don't use the axiom of choice, then some of the uh, theorems become untrue. But most of the results that we want in this module are still true for um, separable norm spaces, ones which have got a count or a dense subset. Most of the things can be proved in those settings um, gen anyway. So there's uh, things like, uh, coming later, like the harm banach extension theorem. You don't need the axiom of choice um, in its full form to prove that if you're working with a separable norm space. But if you're working with something really big, um, which doesn't have a countable dense subset, then you're going to need something like the axiom of choice to, to get you the full power of the harm banach extension theorem. And you know, you have difficulty being absolutely sure that there are going to be any interesting linear maps at all on a general big vector space, um, unless you know you've got a basis of some sort. And the existence of a, of, of a basis for a really big, you know, just a vector space basis for a really huge vector space, um, the fact that there is one, that uses Orn's lemma. Um, and without that, you're in trouble getting started. You, you don't know whether you, you can't really be sure whether you've got any non-zero linear maps at all. And, and to try and find interesting continuous linear maps is uh, even harder. Oh, and then the issue of finding discontinuous maps as well. Uh, there's a real shortage of, um, there's a real shortage of actual Prop, uh, genuinely defined everywhere discontinuous things, as we'll see later. Um, you normally need the axiom of choice to show that there are any interesting ones, um, and so you won't come across them explicitly. You're, but, but on the other hand, you'll know that, given the axiom of choice, there are lots of them. So it's that sort of thing. As soon as you move into infinite dimensions, you do have to, to wrestle with some of these problems. Uh, morally speaking, although I know that the axiom of choice and Zorn's lemma are equivalent, um, the axiom of choice always seems to be clearly true, but the things you can deduce from it, most of them seem to be clearly false. So, uh, so therefore, I'm in a bit of a quandary. Uh, I, do, I work with the axiom of choice, but, but the, the powerful things you can get from Zorn's lemma seem to be too good to be true. Um, so, so I'm not always 100% uh, happy with the axiom of choice, but since a lot of mathematics does disappear, and a lot of beautiful mathematics disappears without it. Um, so what one can say is, uh, if one says, 
I'm not sure whether the axiom of choice is true or false, but the following things follow if you assume the axiom of choice, then you're okay. Any uh, more questions about that? Yes? While I was reading the axiom of choice, I didn't understand it. <laughs> At all, the axiom of choice. I, I found it difficult. Okay. Now, this may be because it seems obviously true, or it may be that you're not sure what it means. Which, which is that? Okay, so so in general, you can ask if you've got two sets whether or not there's a function from one set to another which has certain properties. So given sets X and Y, one can ask, does there exist... a function f from x to y which has a certain combination of properties. At this point I've just realised that I'm not plugged into the mains um, which will probably be affecting the recording quality. So I'm actually going to pause the recording, plug into the mains, and then we'll start again. I mean, not start again, but uh, we'll, we will continue with the session after I've done that. So let's just pause for a moment.